I had been praying, like, God, what is it you want you have for me? What do you want me to share? And I didn't really hear much of anything. So it's kind of like puttering around with scripture and like uh, nothing was really standing out. And then I think it was like Wednesday that I was like, oh, yeah, okay, this is it. Now, Wednesday was also, um, I think it's the last day, like I think all of our kids have been sick the whole week. And so I work from home. So basically, I had way less time available to work on something like a sermon than I normally would. Now, that's not an excuse for what you're about to experience, just to be really, really clear. Um, but what, it, what, it, what I won't do want to sort of say is that for myself, I have a tendency to over-prepare because I am terrified of being up front. Oh, that's better. Thanks, Ross. I'm terrified of being like in a public setting where all eyes are on me and I drop the ball or I drop it multiple times. Um, and so I tend to way over prepare, whether that's having like really intense meeting agenda minutes for a client meeting or whether that's making sure I'm completely ready for something coming up um, or a sermon. Like I like to have every single thing exactly written out. And frankly speaking, I just didn't have time for that this week. And God was very clear with me in the last day. He's like, I did this to you on purpose. I was like, because you love me? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. And one of the major things I've learned is that, or this week, and it's, it's an ongoing thing, but one of the huge things I'm seeing and learning is that God loves me so much and he will lead me through difficult circumstances. And you can define difficult however you want to define it. That's what, that's what it means for you. He will lead me through difficult circumstances, not to break me or not to bring me to the end of myself, or, but he wants, to, he wants to break my reliance on my own strength. And so that's what today is about for me. (sighs) Yeah. Anyways, I'm sure there's going to be more of that. There's a lot more of that. There's a lot more where that came from is what I'll say. So this week I had a moment. I'm sure you guys have had a moment like this. Step in front of the bathroom mirror in the morning. You're going to brush your teeth and you kind of look in the mirror. I'm like, like, you're checking your teeth. And I kind of like look in and you guys might not do this, but I kind of like, You're like, frick. <laughs> this is why I gotta work with myself today. Um, and that mirror reflects things back at me that aren't real flattering. And I go through the day and there's a lot more mirrors in my day. There's other people around and there's my, my work and deadlines and stuff like that. And I have piles and piles of opportunity to evaluate my behavior or my performance. I can evaluate my my looks, I can evaluate my social standing or my, my competence. I mean, there's so many different opportunities where I am reflected back at me. And the message over and over is, I've got to be better. I have got to be better. And so I move through my day and I move through day after day and move through week after week and month after month, just trying to be better. You know, someday I, I work hard enough, I'll get there. Like whatever there actually is, whatever that actually means. I'm like, I've kind of given up trying to get there. And I'm like, if I can just kind of like move the needle a little bit, if I can just, honey, thank you so much. (laughs) Um, I just go through my day trying to be better. And then 12 to 14 hours later, I'm going to bed and I'm in front of my mirror again. And it's kind of like this and like, crap, it's still, It's not better. It's not better. And I end up doubting myself. I end up evaluating myself and constantly coming up short. And so today, this morning, I am preaching to me. I need to be reminded of what's true. And I need a clear, loving kick in the butt And I guess God wants me to kick me in the butt. But today I'm going to talk about three major things. So I'm going to talk about the problems that I'm facing. Um, I'm going to talk about the solution that God's laid out. I'm going to talk about what life living out that solution actually looks like. Um, Now I know it says pray. Usually I have it like five or six bullet points to make sure that prayer is really cohesive and cogent and meaningful, but I'm just going to wing it. So 
oh God, you're here with me up here. And uh, this is going to be a great experience to look back on and learn from. But right now it's kind of scary and intimidating, but I know that um, it's me and you up here together. And so God, I just invite everyone here to join in our interactions up here. And I, I just pray that there's that um, your spirit is at work. And I know your spirit's at work, and I thank you for that. Amen. So each one of us, every single person here, and every single person that's ever been born, regardless of when in history they were born, regardless of what continent or country or race or gender or sexuality, regardless, everybody is born, and they all have the same set of needs. All of us do. You know, we have our specific requirements we need for our bodies, you know, to survive. Um, and then there are other needs that we have that, especially in the last few years, are getting a lot more attention, like mental health needs. And But there's also needs that run a lot deeper that maybe we don't see on a day-to-day basis, but they're 100% driving our actions. And these are deep, subconscious needs that run right into the very guts of who we are, you know, our spirits. That's like our need to, to belong. We need to find a place where we belong, you know? And we'll do lots of different things to try to belong somewhere. Like if you come to a church and like, okay, so this is a church where everyone wears um, bathrobes. All right, well, I'm, it's interesting. Or, or this is a church where everyone dresses up really well. So I don't want to stand out. So I'm going to make sure I dress up really well. That's belonging. I want to belong. I want to feel like I'm par. I don't want to stand out too much, you know? Or there's a need for acceptance, you know, the need to, to experience being loved. And that, we do crazy things for that. Just crazy things. You know, um, sometimes they're crazy small, like silly little things. Like, <laughs> if I'm in a meeting with a client, like we, we use Zoom, which is like a video conference call. I'm sure that normal, rational people minimize their own video so it's not distracting. But I actually always keep my side-by-side video so I can make sure that I don't look too silly you know, as I'm talking or don't accidentally do something dumb because I want to be accepted. And so I'm always keeping one eye on my own appearance. Um, I have to stop that. I have to be better. I need to be better. I need to stop doing that. Um, We have a need for significance. And that drives us so much. That drives us to work long, long, long hours. That drives us to um, try to achieve, try to win for that moment of that feeling of like, finally, yes, people see me and they recognize that is somebody that I want to be like, or that is somebody who obviously is important, or that is somebody, if I kind of do what they do, then maybe I can be like them. And that's, that's what significance says to me. Significance is going to say something different to you, but all of these deep needs are constantly at work in our lives, constantly um, driving us to do different things. And there's a problem with that because, you know, from a very young age, you know, we all learn these little tricks, little tools, you know, these little tactics to kind of to start getting those needs met in different ways. And we've kind of talked through a bunch of those things today uh, already. But as we get older, you know, our, our tactics and our strategies get more sophisticated. You know, you've got your own Zoom video up and you're like, trying to, you're, you're, you get really good at walking the line between looking confident, but not too scripted where it's like, it seems like he's really authentic. He's but he's also very polished. What a, what a fine line. Like that guy's, he's got it together. Like, that's what I'm hoping they're thinking in their minds. Like that's the extent to which I will go. The, the amount of insane, like granularity I will go to, to just try to manufacture a whiff of a sense of my significance being touched on. You know, we try to make your friends laugh. And then, bam, there's that sense of acceptance. And then Jim goes and says something that's even more hilarious. It's because what Jim does. And I'm not the center of attention anymore. And I have to try to do something all over again to get acceptance. You know, we find ourselves in a good relationship. Or we think it's a good relationship or it's a healthy relationship. And like, I am feeling loved right now. I'm feeling loved. And then betrayal sets in. Or disinterest. And suddenly that sense of love that I thought I had is like starting to crumble a little bit. And I'm left with just me. And big questions like, am I enough as I am? I don't think I am. Am I too much for people? Am I not enough? Do I have what it takes? These big, deep, hard questions just, they just run through us. And we can't come up with good answers. I can't come up with good answers. 
So we have a needs problem. I have a needs problem. I also have an inner standard problem, which kind of ties in with the needs problem. It's sort of like, oh, there's like an overlap there. But I think I believe that all of us are born with like this inner sense, this inner standard of behavior that we are supposed to live up to. You know, there's like, there's the moral code. I think most people, if they're filling out an anonymous survey saying, is it okay to cheat? They would say no. Is it okay to lie? Is it okay to steal? No, no. Like, is it okay to kill someone? Like, well, are my kids? No, technically no, definitely not. Lose all these different, you know, this moral code that we're living by. And, you know, we usually have not too hard of a time of living up to that moral code. But then there's also this other code that's in us that maybe isn't distinct, just strictly moral, but it might be drawn from the communities that we're part of as we're growing up or our family of origin or all these different things. Like, make sure you always look put together. You know, make sure your house is always tidy. Don't let guests come over unless your house is tidy, right? And that's an inner standard as well. And it's the kind of thing where, like, regardless of how hard you work to hit that inner standard, you're always going to come up short because there's always somebody who can do it better than you. And if they can do it better, that means you're not doing it well enough. In my experience this week and for weeks on end and months on end and for all my life, has been this exercise, okay, I'm going to try to be better, I'm going to try to get to this point. And I get to that point, it's like, oh, I thought this was what's actually up here. I'm actually being reminded right now of us, I, when, when I was in Calgary, um, this goes back like, I don't know, 12 years, 11 years, I don't know. But uh, my wife and I met in Calgary, I was going to school out there, and I had this friend named Aaron, a uh, really impulsive guy, really athletic, and... I really enjoyed hanging out with him for the most part. And then one day he's like, hey, let's go, let's go, uh, let's go scrambling, which is like mountain climbing, except it's not like super steep. Well, it's steep. Uh, your knees burn real bad if you're climbing those hills. Um, and so we're like, okay, we're gonna get to the top of this mountain. I think it was Mount Baldy, if I remember correctly. So we're going and going. I'm like, I can see the top of the mountain right there. I'm like, this is great. We're almost there almost there. I can just get a little better and get to that point. I can reach this standard. I'm almost at the top of this mountain. And then we get there. And then I'm like, this is a false summit. I'd heard about false summits, but I'd never experienced a false summit. And false summits are the worst because your knees are burning and you can't get any oxygen into your body. It's terrible. And like, and the bar has been raised from here way up to here. It's like this inner standard, you cannot reach it. It's like, it's like the guy on the horse with the carrot out front, or not horse, mule, donkey, guy on the donkey with the carrot out front, like the poor donkey. That's me. I am that donkey. I'm always chasing this dangling carrot of like being, like matching my inner standard, reaching that inner standard. We have an inner standard problem. We can't get there. We try. Some of us have uh, gas tanks that are a lot deeper, a lot wider than others. Others of us can't last that long. That's not how you think it means. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, you work hard and it doesn't take a whole lot to knock you down to the mat. Other people seem to take punch after punch after punch, like Rocky. I think Rocky IV, is that the good one? I don't remember. Anyway, we have an inner standard problem. I also have an inner monologue problem. I don't know if anybody else has an inner monologue problem. Inner commentary, I'm kind of walking through my life and it's like this really vicious, cruel Morgan Freeman or David Attenborough is like, and here we have the wide-bellied business owner sending himself on a deck, ignoring the piles of paperwork. Like this, like really, really harsh, except it's actually me saying it, right? I'm all walking through my life and like, I just notice every single little tiny discrepancy. It's just like, and it's like arrow after arrow after arrow right to the gut. I got an inner monologue problem. And these things have been kicking me all week, all month, all life. There's this big deception that I buy into. You know, culture has this humanistic, me-driven worldview. And for me, all it's created is loneliness and woundedness, conflict and frustration. Doesn't matter how hard I try. The world out there tells me I'm beholden to no one except myself. If it's to be, it's up to me. And you guys know how well that works. 
All of us are here right now. We're not measuring up to our own standard. I know that for sure. Like, we all have an inner monologue. And if it's not viciously taking you apart, it's viciously taking other people apart. The guy up there who's got the bathrobe with a big hole in the side of it. We've all experienced the failure of that worldview. Our personal stories are punctured through with betrayed trust and needless pain. And not only that, but I know that you have also caused pain, needless pain in the lives of other people. Like, the way that we do this isn't working. We have some problems. We are in trouble. Our inner law is an impossible standard, a finish line, always at a breach. It's a false summit. Powerful life patterns trap us in ever-deepening conflict and frustration. We have a ruthless inner commentary. With this is my reality, if that's what I'm seeing and I'm experiencing day in and day out, and there's no hope for me, like, what chance do I ever have of having peace? You know, what, like, what chance do I have of, of having a belonging that's real belonging? Because really, if I have to dress a certain way to belong, is that really belonging? No, right? I was reading my kids um, last night, The Sneetches on Beaches by uh, Dr. Zeus. Nobody? Google it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Great story. Um, But I I also am reminded right now that we do have a glimmer of hope. You know, there's a figure. There's a figure who's, he's waiting in the wings of your life. He's there. He was never gone. You've heard about him. You know, you've had encounters with him. But I can promise you that regardless of what you think you know about this figure, oh, it can't come close to what the actual truth is. He's a perfect father. He's the daddy. He's the daddy that all of us crave. He's the dad every dad wishes he could be. Perfectly kind, unceasingly gentle, unfailingly strong. He's always respectful. And I promise you, nothing can come close to describing or capturing him. All that he can do is love. He is love. He craves justice. He craves it for you. He is a champion of the lonely and the forgotten. He's the pursuer. He's a protector of society's castoffs. He's a healer to anyone who carries wounds, whether they're hidden or obvious. He sees the pain that you've experienced and he wants you to know. He cradles your heart in his scarred hands and his heart breaks for the pain you're experiencing. And he says, are you weary? Are you exhausted? Are your tanks just empty? Will you let me give you rest? I offer relief for your tired bones. He's got an offer on the table. I took that offer up a long time ago, but I forget. I forget. And I need to be reminded of what that offer actually is. He's offering a trade, an exchange. He's saying, Josh, I want you. I want your past, I want your baggage and your your habits and your wounds. He's like, I want your present. I want your decisions, your relationships, and I want your rights. I don't like that one. I want your future. I want your goals, sources of your fear, the source of your anxiety. I want the things you want. And in return, I promise to make you a completely new person. I will rewrite your past. I promise you to replace the regret and the shame with gratefulness. I promise to transform your present. I will give you peace and belonging and significance and acceptance and love that doesn't slip through your fingers with the changing of society or culture's preferences. And I promise to chart you a promising future, one that's good, a future that is not going to harm you. You give me everything, and I'll give you me. Give me your standards for life, your methods of providing for yourself, your self-interest and your self-protection. I'll give you a new identity. 
I commit to provide for you. I'll replace self-interest with my you interest. I promise to care for you. It's a big, big offer. Seems like a lot. Because I, I mean, I know my past. Like I know, I know my success rate. But let's be honest, I have more in the tank. I could probably, if I keep going, I probably have a shot. I probably have a shot at actually starting to hit some of these things I really want to hit. And I bet if I tried a little bit harder tomorrow, I bet I could start to get more of this acceptance and it wouldn't run away so fast. I bet I could. This is a big ask. I don't know if I want it. I know I kind of already said yes, but right now, maybe if I try, I keep trying. You know, I'll just run off to the side here, God, while you... I've got some due diligence that's got to be done to examine and explore this, this, this exchange. And for that, I have to go back to the very moments of creation. It's the center of a lush garden. God, the pinnacle of creativity and inspiration. He's rearranged molecules and atoms, and he's taking the simplest of building blocks and constructing the most complex and nuanced piece of art history will ever see. Us, humanity, Adam and Eve. And to them, he gestures to the landscape. It's warm and it's inviting and all this, this is all yours, he says. And I want you to apply the ingenuity that I put in you and the effort that you, that you so seek to apply and, and that joy that you have. I just want you just to apply that and just do whatever you want to do in this wide world. There's just one catch. There's only one thing that I want you to say no to. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's weird, they the name. I was always wondering as, as a kid. That's a really long name for a tree. I'm sure he could have shortened it. I'm like, so I actually automatically shortened my head. It was like the tree of evil. That's what I always read as a kid. But it's not that. It's not even the tree of good and evil. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Like that is wild. <laughs> like is. Does that mean that God didn't want Adam and Eve to even be aware of the distinct distinction between right and wrong? Is that what that means? I'm not, so I'm, pre I'm not preaching about that today, but that's a question that kind of burrows into my mind. And like another thing, like I have no problem confessing, well, I shouldn't say that. I have a small problem, but I get past them with confessing of doing something evil. But if I'm not even supposed to know the difference between what's good and evil, do I ever confess of doing something good? Like, which kind of, I'm totally going off notes here, but I'm, which kind of goes back to that whole, like, this inner standard. Like, for me, <laughs> in college, there we would have these, um, these dorm, dorm room meetings. We'd all get together and, and uh, you know, I remember, the, <laughs> I remember the first one I ever went to. Um, the, one of the guys was late. And so we're all sitting waiting for him. He comes in and he's like, sorry, guys, I was looking at porn and masturbating. We were like, what? I can't believe you just said that. And it was crazy. Everyone's like, it sounds like, yeah, I, I do that too. And like before, like everyone's confessing of like this. And like, and suddenly that place became a safe place to talk about these bad things, right? But what if he'd said, oh, I'm sorry for being late. I was reading my Bible. Like, how safe does that make that space? Everyone's like, oh, crap. I should read my Bible more. I got to be better. Like, if I'm working on doing things that are good to meet my inner standard, like that actually can cause pain and, and death in other people. And it's like, that totally puts that action in a completely, completely different light. So Adam and Eve asked to not eat the fruit of the tree. And for a while, everything was going great. God would come down and Spend the, the late afternoon and the early evening, like the, my favorite time of the day. Spend it with them just hanging out and they were probably eating. I'm sure they were eating. Chatting about stuff. You know the story. One day, in a calculated moment of defiant curiosity urged on by Satan himself, the world's first humans broke covenant with their creator. And in that moment, sin 
a darkness like no other darkness spilled across the world, rotting and spoiled and cancerous. Nothing escaped its touch, least of all humanity. And that part of Adam and Eve, that function that they had of being able to communicate and connect and receive from God, it was corroded beyond repair. God in his perfect justice and complete holiness had to shut the doors to Eden. He banished Adam and Eve into the world. But God is also love itself, and he had already prepared a rescue plan. Adam and Eve and every human born after them were plunged into a lifestyle of cold, complete self-reliance. There's no other option available. The source of life itself, the source of love itself, they couldn't get anything from him anymore. Like, they did that. It's not really fair to me or you. That's the reality. That's what happened. It really sucks. But God is, loves. He absolutely loves. And he had a plan in place. So while Adam and Eve are eking out whatever existence they could scrabble together out in the world, while I'm out there tr trying to meet my deep needs, sometimes not even being aware of that's what I'm trying to do. But I'm out there trying to silence my inner monologue and meet this inner law that I have and, and be better. God has a plan and a, a rescue operation in place. And that's the trade. That's the trade he's offering. You know, you and I have been put, we were, we're in, in Adam. We're, we're a part of that reality of not being able to receive from God. All of humanity is born into that, and it's not fair, but that's the, that's, that's the way it is. And Father God, he had some big problems to deal with, some major issues. If he, he loves, and he wants deeply to be connected to us, and he wants deeply for us to be able to receive life and love from him. There's two big things that, we, that, that are stopping him from that. Humanity's connection to God had been destroyed beyond repair. That nature of being able to commune with God eroded. And that nature becomes sinful. There's a sinful nature problem that God has to handle. There's also a lifetime of failing to meet the standard, of failing to meet the law, failing to be able to achieve, to be perfect. And that's a big deal too. Two huge issues. But in his perfect ingenuity and creativity, Father God enacted a rescue plan centered around his only son. See, priority number one, that part of our spiritual DNA that can't be rewired or can't be repaired, that part that was intended to receive from God, it can't be fixed. It can't. It can't be repaired. The only way it goes away is when I die. That's when my connection to Adam is, is gone. It's the only way that can be repaired. And God, through Jesus, has, he offered me a way to die. He's offered me a way to be stripped of that old sinful nature. Scrub the board. And it's not like I'm reborn with an empty board and I have to start all over again. It's No, it's, it's actually way, way better than that. It's like that sinful nature, is, it can be gone forever. And when I'm reborn, I'm reborn with Jesus. With Jesus as my spiritual father, not Adam. So I'm not in Adam anymore. I'm in Christ. That function inside of me, that wiring, that DNA that's designed to receive from God, it's, it's restored. It's not even restored. It's there. It's new. I'm, I'm a fundamentally a different person now. And I forget about that because I know what I look like. I know how I behave. But my behavior cannot change Jesus. Can my behavior change Jesus? Absolutely not. I have a new identity that's no longer linked to Adam. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son. <laughs> Whosoever believes in Jesus... Won't, won't die, but they have everlasting life. 
Will you choose to believe that Jesus, as God's Son, lived a perfect life and died and resurrected? And by partaking in that, you can be a new person. That's the first part of the offer. That's the first part of the trade. I've got to let go of all my old, of my abilities to, to eke out a living, to eke out a, a, some kind of a system or tactics for meeting my needs. Having been buried with him, you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. This is Colossians 2 verse 12. When you were dead in your sin and your old nature, he made you alive together with Jesus, having forgiven all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, hostile to us. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Christ lives in me. And the life that I live now today is Josh Gordon. I'm living by faith through Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. So that huge issue, number one, of that connection being, being irrevocably destroyed, God solved that problem. He has a solve for that. In one decisive swoop, he offers a solution to issue number one. Prior to number two, failing to meet the law, I still do bad stuff. You still do bad stuff. And our inner law might look a little different. Your bad might have a different definition than mine does. We still do. And that stuff needs to be dealt with. It doesn't just go away. Flesh and the sin have consequences and their complete, final, and eternal separation from God. And that is why Jesus came to earth. He hadn't been touched by Adam's rebellion, and as such, he lived a perfect and sinless life. He was unmarred by sin, and for the first time in history, there was a person who completely satisfied the demands of the law. He was qualified to receive the consequences for sin. Utter and complete removal from the source of life and from love itself. He was brutally executed by humans who didn't understand their actions. Crucifixion, barbaric, humiliating, and torturous. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Colossians 1.13 For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. That moment on the cross, Jesus took every sin that had been committed at that point in history by every person who lived in that point of history. And then he took every sin of every person who ever would exist. That's everything you've done. Everything you know you're about to do. Everything you're going to do. And it's gone. He punished Jesus for it all. Which means I get off scot-free. Before writing that down, I just want you to know I did Google scot-free just to make sure it wasn't like some kind of like racist thing. But it actually, from an old Norse term, S-K-O-T, scot, which means payment. So I got off without having to pay. It doesn't mean there wasn't a cost, because there was a cost. And Jesus paid it. So I've accepted Jesus' gift. I, I, I've, I've made that exchange. I've made that trade. But I still do bad stuff. I know, I, I know that I died with him in the cross. And when I died with him on the cross, that the old Josh, the one that was irrevocably corroded, unable to receive from God, he died too. I know that when Jesus died, all my sins, my record was wiped away. And I don't have a slate anymore. There's no one t- keeping, keeping track of the things I do, do wrong. 
I, I know that stuff. I'm no longer tied to my sins and I'm forgiven, but, but how do I square the way that I'm living today with, with that? And this is something that this, the response to that is a new thing for me. And I, I, I want to take to John 11. John 11, um, and, and I think it's like the second half of the chapter, uh, we have the story of Lazarus. So there's a couple different Lazaruses that are mentioned in the Bible. Um, some people think they're talking about the same person, but uh, in John 11, Lazarus is a close friend of Jesus. And Mary and Martha, I think, are his sisters. Don't quote me on that. I might be wrong. Could be just friends. Um, that's a problem. No one in this world takes responsibility for what they say, but don't quote me on that. But um, So Lazarus is a close friend of Jesus, and Jesus gets word that Lazarus is very sick. He's on his deathbed. Now, Jesus has a bit of a reputation at this point. He's raised people from the dead. He's turned loaves and fishes into all-you-can-eat buffet for thousands and thousands of people. So if there's anybody who you call when you've got a close friend on death's door, it's Jesus. And if I'm Jesus, I'm like, oh, Lazarus. Okay, I'm off. Jesus waited four days before he left. And before he even arrived, he got word that Lazarus died. And that was one of one places in Scripture where it says that Jesus wept. So Jesus goes to the tomb, and uh, he's like, open up, the, open up the tomb. And everyone's like, whoa, <laughs> okay. He's been dead four days, okay? Like, it ain't going to be pretty. It ain't going to be sweet smell, and it's going to be gross. And he's like, do it. So he does that. So they do. Lazarus, come forth. Probably wonders, like, how long did it take? You know? Like, people are like, is it coming? What's going on? Like, I feel like there's probably, like, a dramatic pause, just enough for people to start to doubt. But then there's, like, this weird shuffling sound. And, like, Lazarus is kind of like, you know, I don't know, or maybe he's trying to do the worm or something like that to get out of, get out of the grave. So he's this guy, he's, he was dead. He was not experiencing life. And he's been brought to life, right? It's like me and you. We used to be dead. And now we're alive. We've been brought to life. But Lazarus is still bound up. And I'm still bound up. I still have so many flesh patterns and habits and things that I friggin' hate. I wish I didn't do that. I'm still bound up by it. And I, 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 can't, I can't free myself. So if I'm Lazarus, I'm coming out. I'm like, you know what? The God of the universe, the one who created all of us. He just brought me to life. And I know I'm just waiting for him to say, be free. He's going to snap his fingers and boom, I'll be free. That's not what Jesus did. Right? Some translations say, Jesus said to the man's friends, unbind him. And I think that's a huge part of my life today is... So much of the freedom that I have experienced and am going to experience from flesh patterns, from ongoing sin that I just can't seem to get rid of, so much of that comes in, like that freedom comes in community. It takes other people to help you. And that's not to say that like somebody else has like the magic key. It's like, no, there's something special. There's something powerful about a person who will burst into the room and say, Sorry, guys, I was looking at porn. Like, when, when there's someone who's open about their own hangups with their own bondage, that ends up creating the, the scenario where freedom can come to everyone. It, sometimes, it, it takes friends. It takes people who love you and support you, who don't identify you by your flesh. They don't identify you by the things you do that you wish you didn't. They don't see you that way. They see you for who you are. Like, they see that perfect Christ-like person who you really are. Like, they see you behind your grave clothes. And it takes a, a community of people like that for you to begin to really experience freedom. And I wish I could speak more persuasively about that. All I can say is that I'm learning that firsthand. And New Life Fellowship is like one of the first places in my life 
where I'm actually comfortable in a bathrobe in front of people. Like, we're Lazarus, we've been brought to life, but we're not experiencing the freedom we were intended. And Jesus plans for us to explore that freedom and experience that freedom in community. So my encouragement to you is live openly. You know, that resistance to, to open up about your, your failure, however, however bad your definition of bad is. When you bring it open, when you're open with that, it loses its power over you. The other thing is that now the standard for success is way different. Like, this is something that my wife had to remind me of. Like, for me today, I, I, was, I knew that what I had to say today, God was going to, he, he gave it to me. And there are big gaps in my brain. I'm like, I don't know. Like, there's, I'm not sure what I'm doing for minutes 30 to 43. Because, like, that's, I don't know what that's going to be. And God's like, don't worry, I, I got you, man. You'll be up. Like, I'm not going to tell you what you're going to say, but you'll be up there and it'll come. The standard for success is no longer, oh, how many people said, wow, mm, moving. You know, how many personal messages do I get on, on Facebook afterwards, you know? Like, that's not the standard for success. Like, the standard for success is, did I trust Jesus to be who he said he would be? You know, do I follow him into something that scares the shit out of me? And do I trust he's going to show up? You can bleep that out. I shouldn't have said it. I'm sorry. (laughs) But like, (sighs) now success for me is, did I follow him? Did I trust him? That's what success is. And I like, I'm just like telling that to myself over and over as I'm like singing. I'm telling it to myself over and over as I'm like getting up here. Oh crap, they don't have a stand here. I'm fumbling for everything. I'm like, just following Jesus. That is what success looks like. And that's what success looks like for us. It's no longer about our inner standard because we have that inner standard in our minds, but that's a, that's a mirage. That's not actually there anymore. Like that vanished with the old you that died on the cross, Right? I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, my body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So how do we walk? How do we go about our day, go about our day to day? Colossians 2, verse 6. So then, just as, in the same way, as you receive Jesus, your Lord, so continue to live your lives that way. What did it take for you to make the trade? I had to be convinced that Jesus was who he said he was. And that's that's what's at play now. For me, it's like now it's time to live that out. Like I'm terrified to take a step forward, but Jesus, are you going to be enough for me in that? And that one step forward is like my decision. Like I believe that you will. And what I am learning over and over again, God is not letting this go for me is that he is earning my trust. He wants to earn your trust with every single forward step that you take. This tiny little step of, of I want to say step of faith, but such a buzzword. It doesn't mean anything to me anymore, but every t- tiny little risk that I take, putting myself out there, like God wants to prove himself strong on my behalf. And that's what he's going to do. Now, am I going to screw up? Yeah, of course. I'm like a little kid learning to walk. You know, like... I've had a bunch of little kids all learn to walk successfully. I feel like that makes me a great parent. So thank you. (laughs) So like, you know, Thorin is like one, he's like toddling around. He falls over. I'm like, Thorin, no, do not fall over. No, that's terrible. That's not what God is like. He's like, buddy, you took a step. Woohoo. Are you shared on social media? Like no one cares, but I do. Yeah. Like, and then three steps and five steps. And now it's like, Lord, slow down. Like, you're going too fast. Like, like, that's what God is like. You know, step by step, following him, risking in response to his invitation. And man, it makes him happy. And I, I just feel like God is saying to me right now that he's so happy with me. I feel like he's so proud of me right now. 
<sighs> it's a really special thing. And I feel like it's special that I get to share it with you guys. You know? Was, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, it's quarter after 11. We don't have, have time for a closing song, but... Uh, and it's exactly quarter after 11. Like, it's exactly the time to stop. So that's what I'm going to do. But I just want to pray. And I also want to say that if there's anybody who wants to share something with somebody that you're struggling with, or talk to Ross, not me. I'm going to cry. <laughs> I'd love to share with you. I'd love to hear it. I know Greg would as well. I know Ross would as well. Um, yeah, let me pray. Oh, what a special time for me and you, Jesus. It's been awesome up here with you. Thank you for being with me. Thank you that I don't have to be afraid of people's, my imaginations of what people are thinking or what's going to go through your head in the drive home or how they're going to talk about the pastor or I can just rest in you and rest in your opinion of me. And it's really special right now because I really feel your opinion of me very strongly. And so thank you so much for that amazing gift of today, Jesus. Amen. Well, I cannot think of a way to gracefully end the service, so consider yourselves dismissed. (laughs) 